as early as the first few years following the conquest of Constantinople and the main centers of commerce and learning in what is today the geography of Greece, there was a great danger that the Greeks, who were by faith Christian Orthodox, would convert, mostly by force, either to Islam or, by choice, to a Western form of Christianity. The second was the greater danger due to the West's perceived high level of civilization, making its adoption easier, whereas the feeling of being conquered by Islam raised reservations and barriers. There is the classic statement by one of the teachers of that period, Cosmos Etolos, explaining why God allowed the Orthodox Christians to be enslaved by Muslims rather than by the Franks, that is, Westerners. 300 years after Christ's resurrection, God sent a Saint Constantine and established the kingdom for 1150 years. Then God took it away from the Christians, and for their own good gave it to the Turk for 320 years. And why did God bring the Turk and not some other nation? For our own good, however, after the dark ages of ignorance and illiteracy of the previous centuries, the roots of education were needed to raise a barrier against conversions to Islam or Western Christianity, to prevent a multitude of small streams becoming a river that would sweep away the nation. The Turkish yoke was a very difficult period for the Orthodox East due both to the dangers and challenges facing the nation and the social changes that were happening, and to the decisive and deadening ritualism that crept into divine worship. Therefore, the social and spiritual life of the Greek was a search for a balance of the old and that which was coming, tradition and renewal and regeneration. At the very same time, the nation was losing blood, because of those leaving and going to Europe, from the proselytism of Western missionaries, the very harsh Islamization from the Turkish yoke, and from the tactic of Turks to gather children and make them into Turks and take them away. Within the personalities of the remaining teachers, mostly monastics and clergy, the nation and the people began to develop a protection for themselves. After Patriarch Genadios Scolarios, the church began to take on the role of Ethnarch, the leader of the nation. The different Orthodox peoples, the Greeks and others, began to gather into local communities to retain their culture and faith and the diaspora began to develop. The learned of the nation attempted to maintain and build themselves. The holy martyrs laid the foundation by their own blood. Teachers were trying to teach again that which they had forgotten or lost. There was a deep, deep search for spiritual identity in this period of the Turkish yoke, and they were trying to turn back to the living tradition of Romasini. What Cosmos Etolos did by traveling around the country and founding schools for the people, the Koli Vade's fathers did at a higher level by publishing and interpreting texts from scripture and the fathers, lives and services of saints, hymns, and even grammar, rhetoric and philosophy textbooks, and also ancient Greek and Western classical writers. Who were the Koli Vade's fathers? And why were they so pivotal in kindling and fueling a fire inside the hearts and souls of the enslaved Greeks?
The Colavades fathers dealt with two main controversies in the 17th century. First, was the question concerning the Eucharist and how often one may participate in Holy Communion, and the second was the place of Sunday in the liturgical life of the Church, and the controversy around the serving of memorial services on Sunday. In the liturgical tradition of the Church, there are no such services as Soul Sundays, but rather Soul Saturdays, which is the day for the martyrs and the repose. This Athenite monastic movement derives its name from the Greek word koliva, boiled wheat, which is used ritually during memorial services. These monastics were nicknamed Koli Vades by their opponents on the holy mountain of Athos because they objected to the transfer of the memorial services involving Koliva from Saturday to Sunday, a practice that they decreed was outside of Orthodox Christian ecclesial orthopraxia and tradition, judging that services for the dead are incompatible with the resurrectional and festal nature of Sunday. In the Orthodox Christian tradition and theology, Sunday is the day of the resurrection of the Lord. Every week is the recycling of the Lord's Pascha. The Sunday after Pascha is the Sunday of consecration, starting again the cycle of Sunday liturgies. This day has a special place in the liturgical life of the Church and the Koli Vades continued very strongly this tradition. Sunday is a day of resurrection, a day of joy, and a day TP celebrate festally. On Sundays, three things not allowed, kneeling, fasting, and memorial services, although funerals can be served, as these are all connected with mourning. If the 40th day of someone's repose falls on a Sunday it should be memorialized on Monday rather than Saturday and we know this from the fact that from Lazarus Saturday until Thomas Sunday no memorials are celebrated, all are moved to a later date. In the Skeet of St. Anne's in 1754, the main church was destroyed. A man named Demetrios gave a considerable amount of money for the rebuilding and he asked in return that they celebrate the memorial services for his dearly repose. The fathers themselves began the process of rebuilding. Of course, memorials should be held on Saturdays, but on Saturday there was a general market in the Athenite city, Carius, and it was essential that they take their handiwork there in order to live. So when could they do the memorial services? They decided to do them on Sunday, and this was the beginning of the controversy. The Koli Vade's fathers who knew the worship services of the church well, could not agree to memorials being done on Sundays. The problem isn't Koliva or memorials, but rather that they would be trampling on the day of resurrection. They truly understood what Sunday meant, the day of recreation. Even if this could happen in the world for some reason, it should never happen on Athos with people who know the Tipicon. There was such controversy over this that some of the Koli Vade's fathers were even killed, their bodies found floating in the sea, they were drowned. This is especially true of the group that had connections in the Patriarchate. The Koli Vade's fathers did not defend themselves, but the other side was continually sending people to have them condemned. They struggled even unto martyrdom. Many lies were told about them, and their enemies called them Koli Vades, and this derogatory term stuck. They were not believed in their day and age, and it was not until the 20th century arrived that people began doing special studies of them and discovering their texts, where they become well known. That is where this ironic word Koli Vades, a person who makes Koliva, comes from, and it became a banner or flag of the group.
Koli Vade's fathers are a great source of inspiration for all Orthodox faithful. They present to us the sources of the Orthodox faith and this is precisely why they are a source of inspiration. They sought not the light of earthly knowledge, but rather the light of divine knowledge through the worship of the Church. Their lives bear witness that they received this light, and were illumined to pass on to the rest of the Church, even though it cost them dearly in their own lifetimes. While this is where the group gets its name, it is not the root of their significance. Their real significance lies in the resurrection of a moribund Greek Orthodox faith as the Turkish grip weakened. One must consider that the Greek struggle for independence was in fact based on a strong Greek Orthodox nationalism. The battle cry of the revolutionaries, for the holy faith of Christ and for freedom, was not chosen randomly. Indeed, the first few words of the cry reveal a strong Christian bias underpinning the struggle. An ideology that provided the backdrop for the rebirth of a whole people. The Koli Vade's fathers were nationalists that equated the Orthodox faith with the Greek nation. This is an extraordinary sign of health at a time of universal demoralization. Their struggle to restore the proper place of the memorial service to Saturdays is a minor detail within the greater work of renewal and enlightenment. It was deliberately stressed and exaggerated at their time in order to obscure the importance of their other work, and also to denigrate them as being people who concerned themselves with petty matters as memorial services and Koliva supposedly were. Fortunately, in recent decades, historical and theological research has shown that the bulk of their work was in fact an 18th-century Philokalian Renaissance. This Renaissance had a decisive impact in strengthening and reinforcing the education of the enslaved Orthodox Christian peoples and in preserving their awareness of who they were, not only vis a vis the Ottoman conquerors, but also vis a vis the Western missionaries who spread out all over the Orthodox world, proselytizing often by unfair means, and especially by exploiting the ignorance, enslavement and poverty of the Orthodox faithful. At the most nominal level, their aim was to enlighten the nation and maintain it in its faith and in the traditions of the Fathers, to preserve Greek Orthodox culture. They wanted to ensure that in the schools, which were appearing in increasing numbers, the teachers, monks and priests would be able to understand Greek texts through school education, but also to publish these texts, since the manuscripts were few and far between, either hidden away in monastic libraries or looted by foreign travelers. One of the major developments of Orthodox Christian spirituality during the latter Ottoman period was the Hesychast Renaissance during the second half of the 18th century. Reacting against the ideas of Western orthology and rationalism beginning to spread among educated Greeks, the leaders of this movement, principally the Koli Vade's fathers, believed that a regeneration of the Greek nation could come only through a return to the patristic tradition. They argued that the true roots of orthodoxy were to be found only there.
The leaders and major participants of the Koli Vades movement included Neophytos Kavsakalavitas, Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, Makarios, Nataras, of Corinth, Nectarios of Pentapolis, Cosmos Etolos, Savas of Kalimnos, Athanasius of Paros, Arsenius of Paros, Nikephorus of Hios, Paisios Velichovsky, also referred to as Paisios of Nemt, and Nicholas Planos. The Orthodox Church as a whole eventually canonized them all and they are celebrated as saints of the Orthodox Christian faith today. Saint Cosmos Etolos traveled throughout Greece trying to return the peasants to their faith and preached frequent communion. Neophytos Kavsakalavitis preached throughout the Balkans and reposed in Romania. Saint Paisios Velichovsky published the Slavonic version of the Philokalia, which greatly influenced the Optina elders. Saint Makarios, Nataras, of Corinth was the author of On Frequent Communion. Saint Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain was the author of the Evagetinos, Philokalia, the Rudda, Christothea, the Synexarium, and On Frequent Communion. Saint Athanasios Parios authored several works against the Western Enlightenment movement within Greece and in favor of frequent communion. Saint Nikephorus of Hios was a disciple and biographer of Saint Athanasius of Paros. Saint Arsinios of Paros preached frequent communion and was also a schoolteacher, as well as the spiritual father of Saint Nectarios of Aegina. Although Neophytos Kavsakalivitis, a celebrated grammarian, is widely considered as the founder of the movement, Makarios of Corinth was the inspiration for the Koli Vades, while Nicodemos the Agiorite was their writer and dogmatician. He assumed the responsibility to write about this controversy, to go all over Mount Athos searching libraries for all the material on Sundays and worship he could find. He discovered a patristic basis for renewed worship, and wrote down the teachings of the Holy Fathers in his Confession of Faith. Despite his orthodox traditionalism, Saint Nicodemus of Athos was willing to make use of Roman Catholic works of spirituality, and he produced adaptations in Greek of Lorenzo Scupoli's Spiritual Combat and Ignatius Loyola's Spiritual Exercises. What Saint Nicodemus seems to have found valuable in such volumes was their use of discursive meditation, allowing full scope to the imagination. This, he felt, helpfully supplemented the type of image-free, non-discursive prayer commended by hesychasm. But the main work, edited jointly by Saint Nicodemus and Macarius, the Philokalia, draws exclusively upon Eastern sources. Literally, the title means love of beauty, love, more particularly, of God as the source of all things beautiful. This vast collection of spiritual texts dating from the 4th to the 15th century has proved deeply influential in modern orthodoxy. Through numerous translations into Western languages during the last 30 years, the work's influence has extended widely into the non-Orthodox world. The book as a whole, without being systematic, presents a specific and coherent view of the Christian life. The main features of philokalic spirituality are 1. Although the texts included are almost entirely by monks, Writing for a monastic audience, the editors intended the book for all Christians, monks and laity alike. 2. The need for personal direction by an experienced spiritual father is frequently emphasized. 3. There is throughout the work a close link between spirituality and dogma. The life of prayer is set firmly in the context of Trinitarian theology and Christology. 4. The main center of interest is the inner purpose of the spiritual way, not the outward observance of ascetic rules. Key concepts throughout the work are vigilance or sobriety, nepsis, 
attentiveness, prasohi, stillness, hisihia, and the continual remembrance of God. The Philokalia draws mainly upon writers in the tradition of Saint Evagrius and Saint Maximus the Confessor, Saint Simeon the New Theologian, Saint Nikephorus the Hesihas, Saint Gregory of Sinai, Saint Gregory Palamas, and Callistos and Ignatios Zathopoulos, but not Nicholas Cabasilus.
Saint Athanasius Parios is one of the best representatives of this movement partly because he was one of the most overtly political. The rationalism of the Enlightenment found its final manifestation in the French Revolution. It was bad enough that Greece was forced under the heel of Ottomans, but the Western Enlightenment was using progress to justify colonizing the world. He argued that liberalism in France, by its very nature, was egocentric, positivist and materialist. These, the likes of Voltaire and Condorcet would say, would liberate humanity. Secularization, for Saint Athanasius, meant that Christianity becomes just one philosophy among others. Morality is reduced to rules since the positivist cannot see anything above the arbitrary individual. Bishops then rule since there is no quantitative way to express the notion of the synodia or spiritual brotherhood. Freedom was, for Saint Athanasius, what the Church had always preached, the liberation from appetites. External forces were not the problem. They were consequences of moral distortion and sin. Rather, it was our internal struggle against the desire for power, money and reputation that were at the root of evil in political and social life. The Philokalia could not have come into being had not the revival of the Greek language been at the center of the Koli Vade's teaching. The rise of scholasticism in the East provided the foundation for a harsh, overly legalistic spirit to develop. The Philokalia was the answer. The Philokalia was the synthesis of several essential factors, the Greek nation, the Greek language, moral reform, and social reform. Within the personalities of these Philokalic fathers, the nation and the people began to develop a protection for themselves. After Patriarch Genedios Scolarios, the Church began to take on the role of Ethnarch, the leader of the nation. The different Orthodox peoples, the Greeks and others, began to gather into local communities to retain their culture and faith and the diaspora began to develop. The learned of the nation attempted to maintain and build themselves. The holy martyrs laid the foundation by their own blood. Teachers were trying to teach again that which they had forgotten or lost. There was a deep, deep search for spiritual identity in this period of the Turkish yoke, and they were trying to turn back to the living tradition of Romiacini. Saint Cosmas of Etolia serves as a good example. In the darkness of the Ottoman period he founded over 200 schools, trying to gather and inspire all the Orthodox people to rise up, and also the Holy Koli Vade's fathers who were trying to bring to life again the experience of the Divine Liturgy. Saint Cosmas worked at the grassroots to teach basic literacy, Greek history and theology. Often, historians and even Orthodox people forget how bad the situation was in Greece, Bulgaria and Serbia in the 18th century. No education, no legitimate hierarchy and even the libraries had long since been pilfered by foreigners over the years. In such ignorance, superstitions and all manner of magic herbs, talismans and fortune tellers proliferated. In spite of their pivotal role in the education of the Greek people, the Koli Vades were persecuted in their time, by brother monks and abbots on the holy mountain of Athos as well as by many of their hierarchical contemporaries. In fact, they were exiled and even excommunicated for a brief period of time. Initially seen as a tragedy, this became a blessing for the Greek people and eventually the Church, upon their restoration.
In many places throughout Greece, and especially on the islands they founded many monasteries where they preserved the typicon and teachings of the patristic church. These were not new ideas that the Koli Vades invented, and in order to be clear on this they returned very consciously to the tradition of the fathers using clear and unquestioned sources. They were not innovators in any way. The Koli Vade's exile and dispersion across the Greek archipelago proved to be essential for the dissemination of their spiritual influence away from their Athenite ecological niche. Nephon from Hios founded small monasteries that were to become in the next century nodes of the small but growing monastic and educational network of the Koli Vades in the archipelago. There is a clear correlation between the movement and the larger area of the archipelago, including Hios and Smyrna. A large number of Koli Vades either originated or studied in the area. Most of the patriarchs that, in any way, favored or benignly tolerated the Koli Vades, Gabriel IV, Procopius, Neophytos VII and Gregory V, originated from or serve as metropolitans of Smyrna. The schools of Smyrna and Hios were frequently directed by Koli Vades, Neophytos Kavsakalivitas and Athanasius from Paros, and served as areas of refuge for many of them. In fact, Hios and the archipelago constituted a space of financial, merchant and maritime growth, an interface for the communication of the two peninsulas Anatolia and the Balkans, and the larger Eastern Mediterranean world in the second half of the 18th and early 19th century. People, products and capital circulated and interacted either in maritime transit for European destinations or mostly to serve the expanding needs of the Ottoman imperial economy. The Koli Vades controversy and the feuds around the school of Athos were closely related to the social and political clash between the Fanario aristocracy and the upcoming merchant class in Constantinople, a class which was certainly reinvigorated by this process of economic expansion. A large number of followers or disciples of the Koli Vades fathers were scions of rich Heo families like the Argentus and the Scanabus. This was also an area that constantly faced the immediate effects of active and aggressive papal proselytism. Greek independence, for the Koli Vades fathers was more than political independence. It was the philocalic liberation of the truth. This is the heart of the nationalism of the Koli Vades. They saw that independence was coming, but it would be useless if it took place absent moral reform, which they argued ought to precede it. The social duties of all Greek Orthodox, according to the Koli Vades, are to, first and foremost, love all Christians and families first. Social unity comes only when men and women as well as older and younger, exist in mutual love. Education, that is, school work, is essential, but must always remain Greek. If one is ignorant of their own history, of their language, their letters, and most important, their own people, they will not be able to understand that which binds a nation and an ecclesia together.